morning. Can you hear me? You can. Good. That's very exciting. It's great to be with you. Um, my name is Andrew, and I'm one of the pastors here. I oversee uh, the music and the worship, prayer, and uh, the uh, kind of like the evening service pastor as well. Uh, and it's great to be with you uh, this morning. We are currently in a series called Making Disciple Makers, hence this brick wall here. Um, I, I've had a few people come up to me over the last few weeks saying, oh, you're doing some more construction. So yes, on the stage, we, we want to get rid of the drum kit. So we, we decided it's just too loud, so we'd build a wall. It's the only way that you can make drummers you know, quiet. That's not true. I was telling a lie. Um, this, this is kind of a symbolic of our series, Making Disciple Makers, borrowing from a theologian called Stanley Harras, who spoke about making disciples as like building a wall or bricklaying. You can watch someone bricklay, you can watch them do it, but unless you actually do it, get involved and, and become a bricklayer by practicing, then you're not going to know how to do it. And in the same way, making disciples, or as we're saying, making disciple makers, is like that. It takes application and hard work. And today we are looking at the subject of be an example or set an example. I don't know about you, uh, I had many role models when I was growing up, still do, um, maybe not as many. Um, but when I, was, when I was a young, impressionable child growing up in Australia, I was mad about sport. Um, I just think that's just the reality of an Australian, you have to be into sport. And so growing up, I, as a young boy, summertime was cricket time. I apologize for, for the Swedish amongst us. I'm going to be talking about sport, which are just ludicrous to you, I'm sure. Cricket um, in the summer, uh, which is where, where someone kind of bowls a ball down really hard and uh, to somebody holding a bat, and they, they hit the ball. And, and when I was growing up, there was this, the Australian captain was a Queenslander where I'm from called Alan Border, and um, he kind of took Australian cricket out of the doldrums, out of losing against England to an amazing side that beat England all the time, okay? And so I remember as a child walking out onto the lush green grass of my backyard with my bat in hand, ready to, to receive the fireballs that my younger brother would send down to me. Wanting in my ready to make a hundred, you know, a century, hundred runs without hitting the ball over the fence, which, as we know, when you hit the ball over the fence, is six and out. And then in the in the winter, it was another Allen. I don't know sure what it's sure about Allens, but there was this rugby league player where I grew up. Rugby league um, was a big sport. Alan Langer, he was uh, a great halfback, played for Australia and for Brisbane, and I used to imagine. So I looked up to this guy as I used to pass the ball, score the try, that I'd be scoring that match-winning try. They were my role models, and I, you know, they, they developed and changed over the years. I don't know about you, do you have role models, even now? Are there people that you look to, that you seek to emulate, that you wish that you could be like, that you look at them and you go, if my life was like that, I would be a very happy person. Do you have those people in your life? I think the reality is, is that um, particularly recently, I, I guess um, that's my experience anyway, we have seen, I think because of media and because of exposure, role models have become few and far between, at least good role models. We have seen many sports people, politicians, even Christian leaders fall, people that we have looked up to as, as people that we could imitate people that we could look to as, yes, if my life was like that person, then I'd be very happy. The stories come through of people who have fallen from grace. And I think that has two effects. Two effects. Firstly, I think that we, we lose confidence. And we think, actually, I don't want to pursue that. I, I'm not quite sure whether role models or being an example is actually worthwhile. And furthermore, I think when I see people that I look up to fail, I then wonder, am I being setting, set up for failure? 
can I have any confidence that my life is going to matter, that I'm not going to be like that person, that I'm going to fall? When I see someone fail, I, I wonder, is that going to be me in 20 years' time? Essentially, I think that, that there has been a lost confidence. And today, I want to look at this passage and I want to encourage us, I want to encourage myself and say that we can have confidence. We can have confidence. Paul gives us confidence. Why? Because there is a confidence in Jesus. There is a confidence in Jesus. And so today, as we look at this passage that Sophina read, we're going to look at three things. Here's the map for today. Firstly, we're going to see that Jesus is the example. Secondly, we are called to set an example. And then thirdly, we are called to make an example. But before I do that, why don't we pray? Let's pray together. God, I thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who is the ultimate example. And not only are you our example, God, but you give us the power and the ability to be an example to others. And so God, I pray that you'll challenge us and that you'll encourage us and that you'll give us confidence to know that we are called to set an example and to make examples. Speak to us and lead us today, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Jesus is our example. Paul starts in verse 14 of chapter four by saying this, I am, I am writing this not to shame you, but to warn you as my dear children. Paul starts with this impassionate plea. It's a, it's, it's a warning. It's, he's, he's, if you see what's happened before, the passage before, he's really giving these Corinthians a stern talking to. He's warning them. It's, it's almost like writing with capital letters or with exclamation marks. Do you get emails like that every now and again? He's, it's an impassionate plea to say, I am warning you. Hear me out. Listen to me. But he's doing it not in a harsh sense or in a way in which it's uh, uh, coming over and, and being harsh, but he is doing it in a way which is sarcastic, yes, but as N.T. Wright puts it, fun-loving as well. He's bantering with them, but he's bantering with them to make a point. How can he do this? What is driving him? What is this unction in him to passionately pour out his heart to the Corinthians? Well, fundamentally, it's because there is a love for Jesus and there is a recognition that he is loved by Jesus and he wants to pass the good news on. He wants to pass the good news on. He is driven by a knowledge and a love that Jesus saves, that Jesus rescues us and has rescued us. That is what is sitting underneath all of this. He knows that Jesus is the one who offers life and hope. Jesus offers us freedom. Jesus offers us life. Jesus offers us hope. Jesus has rescued us. Jesus saves us. And we need to know that today. We need to know that Jesus is our perfect example. The writer to the Hebrew says that he was the perfect sacrifice. He led the perfect life and died the perfect death. He is the perfect example. But it's not that Jesus is just our perfect example, but Jesus is the power for us to also live that example. And Paul recognizes this. This is what sits underneath Paul's drive, Paul's understanding. Let's turn back, open your Bibles, keep it open with me. Verses three and four, let me read this to you of chapter four. I care very little if I am judged by you or by any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. 
I find this a profound statement. What is Paul saying? Well, firstly, he is saying, I don't care what you think about me. Now, this was in the context of the Corinthians having, they were following different kinds of leaders, spiritual leaders. Apollos was one of them and others, Peter. And then there was Paul as well. Now, kind of, who's, who's the most important? Who are we going to listen to? And in this context, Paul says, I don't care what you think about me. I don't care what you think about me. I want to be able to say that. I don't care what you think about me in the nicest possible way. I don't care what you think about me. Do you want to say that about other people as well? Or I, do you struggle with, with a, you know, approval? Seeking others to say, yes, you're a good person. Do you struggle with letting people down, failing people, wondering what they think? Paul here says, I don't care. But what's even more amazing here is he says, I don't even care what I think about me. I don't care what I think about me. I think that's even more profound because we're, we're told in society, well, it's, it, as long as you're okay with yourself, as long as you think highly of yourself, then you're okay. Self-esteem. Paul says, you know what? I don't even care what I think about me. My conscience is clear, but even if it isn't, that doesn't matter why. How can Paul say this? How can Paul say, I don't care about me? I want to say that I think that many of us are held down, are bound because of guilt, because of the way that we see ourselves, because we think that we're inadequate, we think we're not good enough, we don't think we're skilled enough, we're too sinful, we did something back in, in our past and that's ruined it forever. Paul has the courage and the ability to say, I don't care what I think about me. You know why? You know why he can say that? Well, we see it in verse four. My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. It is the Lord who judges me. It is the Lord who judges us. And you know what Paul knows? He knows that Justice has already been carried out. The judgment has already been made. Jesus stands in the gap. It is Jesus who has taken the punishment. It is Jesus who has taken what we deserve. And so Paul can say in faith, no matter what I have done, and Paul will say elsewhere, I am, I am the worst of sinners. But Paul can say here, I don't care what I think, I don't care what you think, I only care what God thinks, and justice has been served, God is the judge, and I am made righteous, I am declared righteous because of what Jesus has done for us. This is so critical. This is so critical for us. This is the gospel. This is the gospel. And it gives Paul, and it should give you and me confidence. Confidence to know that we are saved and that we, like Paul, can offer something. We can offer the truth of the good news, the truth of of the gospel, we can have that confidence. Do you have that confidence this morning? Because as we look about making disciple makers, this is really key. Firstly, because I think many of us rend ourselves, we think we are at least useless. We think we're useless because of who we are, what we've done, what we're not able to do. And we believe the lies. And the invitation to you and to me today is to know afresh and anew. We need to remind ourselves of this. I need to keep reminding this myself. I need to keep preaching the good news to myself that we are free, that we are forgiven. And that in that place of freedom and forgiveness, we have something to bring. 
It's a step of faith. It's believing the truth. And Paul does this. I think there's something um, really profound here about what Paul is saying. When he says in verse 15, or even verse 14, I, I'm writing to you as my dear children. Verse 15, you do not have many fathers, for in Christ Jesus I, have, I became your father through the gospel. He has become the father through the gospel. And here's the reality. Here's the truth. Paul is their father through the truth of the gospel. I want to get your attention here because I want to, this is important. The Corinthians didn't know Jesus. Jesus did not come and visit Corinth. Furthermore, they didn't have a Bible. They had, they, like we have today, we can't open up the Bible or open up our app and read about the, the truth of Jesus and what he has done for us. The Corinthians didn't do that. Paul, as a missionary, went to the Corinth and proclaimed the gospel. So when he says in verse 15, he says, I became your father through the gospel. What he's saying is, I became your father through the proclamation of the good news. And so the encouragement and the challenge for us, I believe, is that, that we know many people who don't know Jesus. They haven't met Jesus. They're not going to open up a Bible and find out, find out about the truth of what Jesus has done for them. And so like Paul, we are called to proclaim the good news to those who don't know. And in doing so, we become spiritual parents. We become disciple makers. Paul became a disciple maker through the gospel. He became a disciple maker through the gospel. So in our workplaces, in our neighborhoods, in our sport clubs, we have the opportunity to be disciples making disciples by proclaiming the good news. And that is what Paul is saying here. It's all about the good news of Jesus Christ. We can have confidence, have confidence. As Paul says, I'm not worried about what you think. I'm not worried about what I think. I am going to proclaim the good news of the gospel. Have confidence. Don't be afraid. Know that Jesus is great. Jesus, who is the original disciple maker, proclaim him. It's all about Jesus. Jesus is the example and then we get this big, as Paul loves, I think Paul's bit favorite word in all his letters is that word, therefore. Therefore. We see it and it's, it, he, he does it a lot. And as my dad said, and I've said before, when you see a therefore, you, you need to see what it's there for. But we're not going to do that now because we've already done that. We've already looked at Jesus. So let's keep moving on. He says, therefore. Therefore. I urge you to imitate me. Imitate me. Now that is a big call. In fact, that's a pretty scary call. Any, any parents here, you will know that the word imitate me is very loaded. Um, I asked Megan yesterday, Megan, are we starting to see Olivia? Olivia's our almost two-year-old. Um, is she starting to imitate us at all? And we're trying to think. And then as on cue, Olivia just started to imitate our words like a parrot. So I said, oh, I don't know, I think I was watching the rugby or something and said, good, good, I'm not quite sure what it was. And then she said, good, good. And then, and then Megan walked in the room and she said, hi. And Olivia went, hi. It was like a parrot. And I'm sure that that will progress and then we will see all the bad bits of ourselves being played out for any of you parents. I'm sure this is a reality. Children, you, you can tell children, you know, what to do, but fundamentally it's about do as I do, not as I say. And that is what Paul is doing here. Imitate me. That's a big call. And the reality is, is he understands there is something about family which is hugely influential. Now, is he being manipulative here? You could read this and go, man, he is just manipulating the Corinthians. He's saying, I'm your dad and you should do what, what, I, what, what I tell you to do. 
And some people read it like that. But I don't think that's the case. And they say in parenting terms that as a child, when a child is young, you, there, is a certain, there is authority through discipline that you have with your child. But as the child grows up, there is authority through influence. Through influence. And I think that that is what Paul is doing here. He is wanting to influence them through the reality and the truth of what Jesus has done in his life. And he wants them to know that truth as well. And so Anthony Thistleton, a um, theologian, says, power here, we see repeatedly in these verses, has to do with the effectiveness of the gospel in life, not with rhetorical manipulation. We see in verse 15, then, if, if Paul is, is assuming a role of the Father, he says, even if you had 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers for in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. Here's Paul's point. We need parents, not babysitters. We need parents, not babysitters. Now I use the word um, babysitter because that is, that is the, the word that best illustrates what Paul is using, saying when he says guardian. Because guardian is, it can be a loaded term and, and it's a very good term for us in our, in our culture. As is babysitter. Babysitter is as well. But Paul is saying here, you've got loads of babysitters. But I, you need fathers and I am going to be your father. And a babysitter is a very different relationship to a parent. A babysitter is not responsible for the ultimate provision of food and shelter. A babysitter has not invested the time in the growth and nurture of the child. A babysitter has not been there since the beginning of the child's life. A babysitter cannot discipline the child, nor has the same influence over the child. A babysitter is not required to stick it out in the early hours of the morning and when things go wrong. You know this, parents, don't you? It's a different relationship. Fundamentally, babysitters are passive they're passive. Parents are active. And Paul is saying there are many, many passive babysitters in Christ, but you need spiritual parents. I am your father in the gospel. And I wonder today how many of us in this congregation, in this church, are babysitters. And how many of us are parents? The difference being we can, we can just rock up and be nice to people and say hi and not really engage with the community, not really get involved in people's lives. We just turn up and kind of do the stuff. That's a babysitter. Or are we parents where we choose to get stuck into the lives, mentor, see people come into a relationship with God and see them grow up in faith, investing your time and your life, being there when things are difficult and when things go wrong, seeing a child grow up into maturity. That is what we need in this church. That is what the Christian church needs people who are willing to invest their time and their lives into those who are growing up. And so I ask you and I, I ask me this morning, who are those people that you are pouring your life into? Are you a parent or a babysitter? Are you a parent or a babysitter? It's hard work. It's hard work, but it will leave a legacy. And Paul recognizes this. And so he says in verse 17, he says, for this reason, I have sent to you Timothy, my son, whom I love, who is faithful in the Lord. He will remind you of the way of life in Jesus Christ, or Christ Jesus, which agrees with what I teach everywhere in every church. Paul has made an example in Timothy. Now, when I say make an example, that may sound like a negative term, 
And it usually is, you know, at school or with punishment, you know, someone is made an example of, I'm going to make an example of you. I don't know if you saw this, sorry to keep the the sport theme going. Uh, This week, the Australian cricket team, um, four of their top players didn't hand in homework that was given to them by the coach. So the coach asked for three things that how they were going to improve their cricket because they're getting absolutely belted in India. And four of them didn't hand in their homework. Naughty boys. And so they were, uh, they've been taken off the team for, for a match, one match. They've been given a one match ban. And it's been fascinating just to see the uproar. You know, the English press have loved it. They're, ah, oh, the Australian group, they're absolutely in turmoil. And we are, but we still will win the Ashes. Um, and, and, it's, and it is just bizarre. It's just bizarre. I, just, I don't know why you're laughing. There was a cocky arrogance, I thought, in that laugh. Um, anyway. And what was the point? So the coach was trying to say he was making an example of these four guys because he was not happy with the culture in the Australian team. So fine, I'm going to ban you guys for one match because I'm going to make an example of you. That is not the example necessarily that Paul is trying to make here. He is making an example in a positive sense. Timothy, he has poured his life out into this young man, Timothy. Now, who is Timothy? Timothy. Well, Timothy was a young man when he joined Paul on his journeys. He may have been a, a late teenager or in his early 20s. And if you, we look at the, the letters that Paul writes to Timothy, he was a young man, very different to Paul. Very different to Paul. He was shy and quiet. He needed constant encouragement and reassurance. He struggled with health. He wasn't the, the most robust personality. Nothing like Paul. Paul. But that didn't matter to Paul. I think there's something in that for us. We don't need to look for clones. We don't need to look for the per- some person who's exactly like us. What we need to look for is someone who is willing to learn. Someone who is willing to apply an, a, a, their life to receive the gospel and to work at, at it. And we see that with Timothy. Who are your Timothys? Who are your Timothys? And so Paul writes to Timothy later on in, 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 the, in the first letter to Timothy, Timothy 4, verse 12. Don't let anyone look down on you because you're young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Disciple making disciples. Paul was not just interested in discipling Timothy. He was interested in seeing Timothy go on to make disciples. Making disciple makers. Before I moved to the UK, I was part of a church and I oversaw or helped lead a connect group for a couple of years. And a couple of weeks ago, I was able to uh, go back to Australia to do some ministry with this same church. And I was huge, one of the most encouraging things uh, of that quick trip back was young people coming up to me, four of them in fact. Two of them had gone on to, uh, are now on the pastoral team at, the, at this church. Two of them, or two couples, both couples got met and married in, our, in, in that connect group have gone on to be connect group leaders. They were part of my connect group. And they came up to me and said, Andrew, you know, remember we we were in your connect group and now this is what we're doing. One guy came up and said, yeah, me and my wife, we we have, we've, we've just started a connect group. You let us, have you got any tips for us? What, what should we do? I was abs- I was so encouraged. I'm not telling you this to be arrogant because I was 22 years old when I was leading the group and I had no idea I promise you, I had no idea. These, these, these guys were about four years younger than me. They were at university. I was, had just started in my career uh, in oil. And we just made it up as we went along and they just, we just shared life together. 
I'm not telling you this because I think I'm great. Because trust me, I'm not. I'm telling you this is because when we put ourselves out there, when we say, come on, let's just follow Jesus together. It's amazing what Jesus does. So it's don't follow me as I follow Jesus as much as it is follow me as we follow Jesus. And so I leave you with three questions today. Do you have a true confidence in the gospel that enables you to make disciples? Do you have a confidence to say, yes, I believe the gospel and I've got something to give and something to say to the world around me and to the community that I'm in? Second question, are you a babysitter or are you a parent? And thirdly, who are you giving yourself to? Who are you investing in? Are you making a disciple maker? Shall we pray? God, we thank you for people like Paul who were just so transformed by you. Who just knew the life-giving power that Jesus, that you offer. And I pray that you will set our hearts on fire just as we were praying before, as we were worshiping God, that you will give us a renewed love and a renewed sense of all that you are and all that you've done for us, the truth of the gospel, the truth of the good news that you have done it for us. The judgment is down and we have been declared righteous. And out of that place, God, may we be used Lord, I pray that you'll be raising up spiritual parents today. Spiritual parents who are passionate and called to make disciples. Disciples in our society, in our workplaces, in our neighborhoods. Disciples in this community, in this church. God, set our hearts on fire with love for you. Will you grow us and will you multiply us? Speak to us, I pray, in Jesus' name, amen.